Welcome to Diversity Matters. This program is designed to highlight the diversity-related activities throughout New Hanover County Schools and the greater Wilmington community. I'm Valida Quattlebaum, Chief Communications Officer for New Hanover County Schools. This month on our program, I'm thrilled to devote our entire show to my special guest, Mr. Lawrence Epps. Mr. Epps is a Wilmington native and a retired New Hanover County Schools teacher. He is a local historian in his own right, and he's here with us today to share his extensive knowledge of the history of our area. We'll discuss his role in the civil rights movement, the integration of our local schools, and his vision for the future of education. So, don't go away. This very special edition of Diversity Matters will get started right after this short break. You've got a better chance at getting picked for a cool job with great pay if you take algebra, geometry, and calculus. You need to know how math can improve your future. Demand it. Call NACME. We'll tell you. Get in the game. And welcome back to Diversity Matters. In honor of Black History Month, I'm very excited to welcome to the show my guest, Mr. Lawrence Epps. Mr. Epps is a native Wilmingtonian and he is a retired New Hanover County Schools educator. He is also a local historian in his own right and he's here with us today to share his extensive knowledge of the history of our area and our school system. Welcome Mr. Epps. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself, where did you grow up and what schools you attended here in New Hanover County? I grew up on the north side of town, which is referred to as Brooklyn. I started out in elementary school at Peabody School. And when you finish Peabody, you cross the bridge, so to speak, to go to James B. Dudley, which was the other elementary school. From James B. Dudley, we had this great phenomenon that happened in the Brooklyn community, the building of D.C. Virgo School. First of all, after leaving Dudley, we immediately moved to Williston for eighth grade, and then all of a sudden, D.C. Virgo was built. And then at junior high school, I went to D.C. Virgo Junior High School at the time. After leaving D.C. Virgo School, it was a time of integration, and one of, as a part of the integration process, I then went to New Hanover High School, where I graduated from. Okay, so that must have been exciting for you having this new junior high school built right in your community, D.C. Virgo. It was exciting in the Brooklyn community because probably we were the poor section of town. Mm -hmm. And in that section to have something on the scale of a school being built, and we were excited because we saw this building which looked like a sort of a spacecraft on stilts. <laughs> so we were excited about this building and that we we're going to be a part of it. And then we had our own junior high school in the Brooklyn community. Okay, so here you are, this young lad, a child of the 60s. And of course, that was right at the time the civil rights movement was happening. And um, I've been reading a lot about it lately. And I know Wilmington had played a key role in it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like the Wilmington 10 and then they, some of them were involved with the Greensboro sit-ins. I think for me as a part of that was probably marching in the demonstrations in that era, um, being an active part of the demonstrations is probably my most vivid memory. Mm -hmm. I remember marching Dr. Joyce Jones and some other people who she's still around who, mm -hmm. who's leading, the, um, leading those demonstrations and then as a student, she was a student at Williston High, junior, a senior high school at the time, and going to demonstrate on Princess Street. So I remember the fire hoses being pinned against the Dixie Cafe. I remember the fire dogs. Fire hoses here in Wilmington. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember the dogs. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a mark here where the, you know they had the dogs as we were demonstrating in and those you all particular were times. just students we were just students then but we knew the vision and we knew the nonviolence of being a part of history at that time mm -hmm. so it, it, it was a very vivid um, experience I think that's mainly my um, remembrance of the civil rights at that particular time mm -hmm. 
So were you all involved with, um, I guess, getting information from Dr. King's group? Yes, we were involved, and I remember um, Joyce being a major part of that, of filtering down the information of, of this, teaching us to be nonviolent, mm -hmm. teaching us how to protect ourselves if we were you know, confronted in any measure. Mm -hmm. So all of that was very important at the time. But I think the most interesting part was how to participate in a nonviolent fashion to make sure that the goals that were set, um, that were being met, um, how to do the songs, but looking for the vision that we hope would come right. at some point. And that's amazing because so many people are demonstrating now, you know, sometimes I wish they could learn some of the lessons from the past because um, the demonstrations often turn violent. Right. And I think that, um, you know, it's okay to demonstrate, but you have to, you know, keep certain values of what you're trying to accomplish in mind. And I think one of the most important modes of, of this whole idea of thing, non-violence. Right, that was the difference. Non-violence, mm -hmm. and, and we were taught that more than anything. No matter what was done to you, mm -hmm. you had to remain calm. And I, I think the music of the time, of the songs that we sang during the demonstrations, was just sort of like a, a catalyst of inspiration of that there's a goal to be met here, and you just right. sing that no matter what happens to you. Um, so the nonviolent aspect of it is, is quite important. I, I, I agree with you that it, it's all right to demonstrate, but it's important that you do it in the proper way. Okay. And you mentioned that you were one of the first group of African-American students to, um, to integrate New Hanover High School. Right. What was, was that like? Of the first or second. It was an experience that um, we were excited for high school and junior high school to go to Williston Senior High School. That was the joy of the moment. Right. It was, it was excited about that. And I remember in junior high school, um, Mr. Dorothy B. Johnson, who Dorothy B. Johnson School well, was school named, was named after, right, right. Um, was my homeroom teacher at the time. And Teachers at that time were always talking about the future and the civil rights movement. And she said, we need to be involved in this movement. And some of you, um, you can get involved. And one way to get involved is to be a part of integration and to then, therefore, see if you might want to try to do this part in integration and go to one of the white schools, mm -hmm. which was New Hanover High School at the time. So, Gene Rogers, Belinda Mack, um, Andre Millette, I think, who came later, who Yeah, he became our HR director for the Right, channel. and mm -hmm. some other students. He came, I think he came the next year after me, mm -hmm. um, decided to go to New Hanover. And I think it was about 20 of us that year. And New Hanover at that, New Hanover High School at that time was the Second largest school in the state, about 3,000 students, and we had sort of a flex schedule. I think some went at seven, some at nine, and so forth like that. So it was a daunting process in the fact that I had gone to predominantly black schools, and here we were in a sea of thousands of white students. Now, what so year was this? This, this was 1965, I believe. Okay. And so we were in a sea of, of uh, thousands of white students that we had never a situation that we had never experienced before and was it disruptive was it violent was it did it they was, receive you it was not disruptive at all I think we were probably a, as a new phenomenon to them <laughs> as we were to them. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that was very interesting and so you went through that and then you come back to New Hanover County as a teacher right okay so Tell me, you taught how many years, and what's one of your favorite stories from your time teaching here in our district? Probably one of my favorite times is the reversal of the teaching process. I think teaching teaches you so much about living. It teaches you so much about life. And I think you become a better teacher each year mm -hmm. because the two students teach you. They do teach you. <laughs> yes, right. They teach you so you become a better 
each year. But I think you never reach the vision of being the best teacher you can ever be mm -hmm. because there's so much you want to do or so much you think you can do. And even now, after these years of retirement, I think, gosh, if I had done this in the classroom, I wish I knew how to do this in the classroom. It still haunts me today. I would have been a better teacher. So I, I think the goal of reaching the best teacher you can be is one of the experiences. I think for me, the greatest response, <laughs> when we had to pass the North Carolina teachers' um, competency requirements for the computer was probably the greatest learning experience for me because these students that I taught every day became my teacher and they taught me the computer skills to pass the test. They'll do that. They yeah. still do that. Yeah, and it was mm -hmm. one of the most enriching experiences because they became my teachers and it was so funny because all of a sudden they would use their lunch times to come, their lunchtime to come and work with me on certain skills and get upset and tell me, gosh, you don't know anything. <laughs> because I didn't learn the skills as rapidly as they thought I, I would. So they became the teachers and a lot of times their parents, out, and they would see, some of them would even stay after school. To help you. Yes, and their parents would just look at it and it's say It's amazing that, with kids when you right. give them that love and that um, teacher-student relationship, they return it. Yeah. In such a powerful way. And I could look at some of the parents and they were sitting in their cars and look at that, don't teach your teacher <laughs> my child. Because, uh, but they were doing a good job and they finally got me. To, but I think what happened there, they learned so much about teaching. I think they learned much more as well as I learned because they learned planning, right. objectives, because they had to do that for me. Right. And so that, that was a skill and I think that was a very interesting learning experience for me. So what do you see as the major difference uh, between education now and in the time when you were teaching? I think testing became an important part of education during the time I was a teaching. What I think has happened now, I think testing has become the main focus of the teaching process. Mm -hmm. I think somewhat what the child needs to learn to be a citizen has been lost. Because so much emphasis on because the Because so testing. much emphasis is on the testing. What happens when the child moves to the next grade? It's mostly about his or her test score. Right. Well, how does this test score impact upon the child's future? Right. Um, is this test particularly geared toward this child's style of learning? Mm-hmm or is it geared toward the modes that are set up about the powers that be that this child should be at this particular level. Right. And it, Every child is not going to go right. to college. You know, we're still going to need plumbers, we're still going to need electricians, mm -hmm. um, we're still going to need a lot of other jobs, so maybe this is the best focus for this child. Right. Um, and I think that's the part that's missing Yeah, the missing testing out. does seem a bit out of balance. Yes, I do think so. Well, fascinating talking with you. Don't go away. We're going to take a short break, but we'll continue our fascinating conversation with Mr. Epps when we return. Your baby needs you way before she's born. Needs you to see a doctor. Get checked out. Make sure everything's okay. If every baby got this kind of care this early, there wouldn't be so many sad stories. Just be a lot more happy ones, like you want. For places to get free or inexpensive prenatal care, call the Prenatal Care Hotline, 1-800-311-BABY. Your baby needs you now. We're back with Mr. Lawrence Epps. Mr. Epps, um, I'm so fascinated by talking to you and when we were preparing for this interview, you talked a lot about diversity and why you think it's so important. Tell me why you think that we need diversity in our schools and why you feel that it's that important. I think diversity is, is quite important in our lives. We live in a melting pot society where we're involved with people of all races, mm -hmm. of all genders, and of all different aspects of life. And we live in a society where we meet these people, we talk to them on a daily basis. And I think it's important that we teach our kids about adversity so they're involved in a lifetime experiences as life goes on. 
Now, what happens, you know, here in our school system now, we have schools that are predominantly one group, ethnic group or the other. What do you see as the downfall for our children when they don't get to mix with other types of children? I think it becomes a lifetime experience because once they leave their particular schools, then what happens in life? They will get into a place where they have to work with you all kinds of people. You have to work with and all. with the globalization of the world, they're going to be working with not just Americans, but right. all people from all over the world. And what is education but to prepare you for life in all aspects of life? So therefore, I think as a part of your educational process, you learn that. Mm -hmm. And you need to learn that just as well as I prepare you for that end of grade test, then I need to prepare you for working with all peoples in all aspects of life. Okay, that's powerful. And so, you know, having been a lifelong educator and a person who's from Wilmington, what do you see happening on the education scene now? What would you say are our students need the most now? Where can we improve, I guess, is what I'm asking. Probably, in my humble opinion, I think probably one of the, the things that you're going to need to improve is engaging kids in their life experiences as to where they want to go. Um, where they want to go as learning about our nation, mm -hmm. first of all, and all that it offers. I think they need to be taught what a great nation this is. They need to be taught its history and how this history is developed because as the history of the nation has developed, so has its people and their lives is a development. If you look at their childhood, they'll begin to see changes as to happening. Then what do you do in the school system? I think as far as education, you need to help them develop a plan for their life mm -hmm. and a, a plan or an architectural system that they can branch off from. Right. The plan may say, hey, John Ellsworth wants to be a doctor. Well, John, this is the plan for you to be a doctor. Right. We're going to work through this. Now, John may change that and may decide that he's going to go in a different direction maybe a computer technician. John may decide, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to run my own business. But at least he has a plan from which to go. Right, and again, how to, get there. how to get there. But you're preparing him for life. Right. You are giving him a guide, but you're also giving him an option as far as educational plans to work with. And I think lessons somehow need to be designed in that way. I definitely think we need more of that because listen, let me tell you what I'm hearing from some of our teachers. We are graduating many students and we're sending them off to some of our great institutions, right. especially here in North Carolina. But within that first year they go, a lot of them have to come back because they find that they're not ready, they can't make decisions. I think we're, we are falling into a pattern where we have so many a helicopter parents where we do everything for our children and and uh, one of the downfalls we're seeing is that kids some students are not able to handle things themselves you know what I mean like we filled out all the applications for <laughs> them we helped them get all the scholars we did every single thing for them then they get to say North Carolina State and they have to wind up coming back home you must know something about me <laughs> because you, you described me there very well I went to college. Uh, my mother had a fourth grade education. Mm -hmm. So for me to finish high school was a great accomplishment for her. And she just felt so great about that. But I went to college. I stayed two weeks. Two weeks? Two weeks. So wow. I said, you must know something that I, <laughs> that I think you knew. And I called her. And of course, she said, well, come on back home. Came back home, immediately enrolled into what is now called Cape Fear Community College, and then it was just those three buildings there mm -hmm. on Front Street. I mean, three-story building on Front Street. They hadn't even added the two new stories yet and enrolled in Cape Fear Technical Institute because I evidently wasn't ready from being away from home from mom. And I stayed there that year and started in business administration. 
And then in talking with her, she said, do you think you want to go back? And I said, I don't know, because then it, I, I had no idea of what I was going to do. And then I went back to college. Which college? And got that? to, when I graduated from Winston-Salem State Winston University. Winston-Salem State. State, okay, great. So another thing we're dealing with here in the school system is having trouble finding young minorities who want to go in education. I mean, we've seen um, the enrollment of people who want to be educators drop tremendously across the board because you know some of the struggles we've had with teacher salaries and so forth. But in particular, you talked about uh, we need minority role models for our students. What do you think we can do to encourage more young minorities to become educators? Again, I think that's where um, teaching becomes importing, important. I think um, teachers, as they do now, have to continue to set the example of what a great profession there is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things that the powers that need to be need to support teachers as far as discipline in the schools. Right. Um, if you don't do that, then kids see what other kids do. They see what happens to other kids when the discipline seems to fail. Right. And therefore, their idea is who wants to be involved in that. Right. They um, see that teacher being abused they not, see that and, teacher not being, and not supported. Right. So they, why would they want to go in a situation where is that? Um, I have a small business and um, the students at the school had to pass there. So I would sometimes come out front and just listen to the kids and their thoughts and how they acted. Mm -hmm. And even as an adult, they would pass me and, you know, without any reflection. As a matter of fact, I saw that yesterday and I was just upset about it and realized that, gosh, you can come from school, you can, you can say what you want to say, you can do with that. How can you just step out the door with that type of thing? And the stories I hear from students, mm -hmm. um, as to how they sneak and use their cell phones, as to how they do what they call get over in classes, right. I realize right. that. But um, I'm old fashioned when it comes to discipline in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, real old fashioned. And I think principals as well maybe have gotten along with how I dealt with discipline. But if you don't have discipline, how can you Teach. encourage a child to right. learn? Right. Um, that has to be strong. And that not only needs to be in the classroom, but teachers have to be supported mm -hmm. from the powers that be that this type of behavior is not going to be tolerated at any level. Mm -hmm. And if this causes some problems with parents, then so be it, you know, because everyone is after the child being the best that he or she possibly can be. That's right. But you gotta do it in the right way. Right. So that's my okay. spill on it. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, we have schools here where we have so many students who receive um, free and reduced lunch in one school. And typically those schools are struggling. You know, they're That's struggling. Right. What can we do about that? What can we do to help improve those schools? I think one of the um, things I, I, I worked on the first part of the school year, um, and maybe just work for me, I don't know, but I, I like to share it, is probably student self-esteem. You've had students that you have deemed um, needing remedial work all the time, and mm -hmm. I think, and that's fine, but I think what intrinsically you have done here, you have told that student that he can't learn. Right. That it's a difficult situation for him. Now, I, 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 I can't say that I know the answer, mm -hmm. but once you have told a child that first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, that somehow that child... He believes you. He believes what has you thought you were doing to help him. Right. And um, you still have a difficult time. So I usually would take that first, sometimes it took a whole nine weeks to work on self-esteem, that you are somebody, mm -hmm. that you can achieve. You can learn. And then right. I expect excellence for you at all time. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna have it out you in this classroom or no one else's classroom. Mm -hmm. And if I come down the hall and I see there's a problem, then you're gonna have to deal with me. Right. I expected 
that. Um, I, loved, I loved having an AG class, but I also learned, loved having a real, real class that, <laughs> that struggled. <laughs> that was really struggling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I had to sometimes bend those lesson plans. And sometimes what happened was you, you made them feel that, they say, I'm smart kids doing that. And I would go in this thing, oh, what's wrong? What do you mean, smart kids? Right. Are you not smart? Right. And That's I had right. to use that technique a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And I did it for improvement on test scores, of course, because mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. I had to do that. But I think you have to work on their self-esteem mm -hmm. and them believing in themselves. And the expectations. And expectations have to be beyond high, that, high. A, a, extremely high expectations at all right. times. Even working with my godson at some point now, and he wants to do it, I said, no, 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 mm -hmm. this is not acceptable. Right. But you will they do. don't care. No, I, but I care. I care. And right. if I care, you're going to care. Right. So those You're important. obviously a teacher that every parent would want <laughs> for their child. So as we close this out, what's your last parting wisdom you'd like to give us? Me as an administrator <laughs> here, we're trying every day to do everything we can for all 26,000 of our kids. What w wisdom would you give us? I don't know if I have a whole lot of wisdom to give <laughs> if I'm not that person. I, I th think that I've learned and I've always instilled in my kids and I instill in people that I meet now that life is a learning experience and you're going to constantly learn every day of your life and that that you learn you share with other people and you learn from them and as a result all of us become better we so become I think better. I, I, I think that you just can and I, I'm so excited about life and I'm so excited hate it that I don't learn everything, just everything that around me, how a leaf grows, why it mm -hmm. grows, and those kind of simple things. So I think learning is the key and, okay. and, and impart that learning with, with to someone. Each one, teach one. There you go. Very All well right. Stated. That's wonderful. Now don't go away. We'll come back and we'll wrap up our show. Langston Hughes emerged from the Harlem Renaissance as the most prolific and successful African-American writer. Hughes published several volumes of poetry. In his writings, he experimented with a variety of forms and techniques and often tried to recreate the rhythms of contemporary jazz. His best-known collections of poetry are The Weary Blues and Dream Keeper. This background in literature has been brought to you by New Hanover County Schools on the Learning Network of the Cape Fear. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Diversity Matters. If you would like information about our district's ESL program, please call Maria Black at 254-4202. And feel free to call my office, the New Hanover County Schools Public Relations Department at 254-4245 if you have a story idea for future editions of Diversity Matters. Until next time, I'm Valida Quattlebaum. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next month right here on Diversity Matters. <laughs>